Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, our facial plastic reconstructive surgeon, Dr. Kofi Bohini, will be speaking about saving face, expert advice to help freshen an aging face. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you're comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenter. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. Please note this program is being recorded. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation, so please note, if you do not want your name attached to your question, please check send anonymously. Also, your email address will not be shared with any third parties. We will do our best to answer all of your questions we receive during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we will greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of our program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Kofi Bohini to begin our presentation. Thank you and welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online web, webinar series. Today, we're going to talk about an, an important feature of, uh, our, of all of us, our faces, and how it ages, and how we can put our best face forward. I am the Director of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at Johns Hopkins, and, and over the next um, hour, I'd want to just provide some information about how the face ages, what makes the face look rejuvenated, and give you some options of, on how to uh, uh, freshen your face and maintain what you have. Um, Johns Hopkins is known for uh, uh, as being an, an innovative place, taking care, care of um, very serious medical issues. And one would not think um, about the face and the aging process as one, particularly in this era that we are dealing with um, COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. Ha having said that, um, we we always want to associate healthy living with healthy appearance. This is a, a quote that I read recently from one of our um, beauty magazines by a model called Molly Sims. She said that I have come a long way from my modeling days and I always wanted to look good, but now I also want to look healthy. And I will paraphrase that by saying, it is healthy to look good, and it's also good to look healthy. And as with every aspect of medicine, we approach facial aging at Johns Hopkins backed by science and um, medicine. Today, I hope to shed some light on what defines a youthful face and what makes the face look re rejuvenated. How do our faces age? Can we actually predict how would we look five, 10 years from now? And in that case, can it help us slow down the clock or even turn back the clock? How can we freshen our facial appearances without it looking done, operated, or operated? How can we freshen our faces and have it have a natural looking appearance? So what defines a youthful face? We've all gone through our aging process differently and regardless of our ethnicity, there are certain unifying features of a youthful face. The skin is radiant and even textured. The upper portion of the face is wider than the lower face, almost in the shape of an egg. We tend to have high arched brows and short eyelids. The face is defined by a contract of light reflections on our cheeks, our foreheads, the nose, around the lips, contrasted by shadow areas in front of the ears, under the neck. We, we maintain facial volume in our cheeks and the corners of the mouth are horizontally oriented. And one very defining feature of a youthful face is the nicely well-defined neckline. So 
a youthful face has short eyelids that transitions into a, a smooth cheek with mm -hmm. volume, wider on, wider on the upper face, narrow on the lower face, high exposed arched brows, well-defined neckline. And because of that, we tend to mimic that when we put on makeup. So this is a picture of a model and you can see the highlights on the cheeks have naturally accentuated with makeup. We presently have the technology to be able to map someone's face and we can show how they are going to age over time. We can show how they've aged since their twenties and thirties. And these technologies actually helps us predict how people are going to look five years, 10 years down the line, and it helps us plan rejuvenating uh, procedures for them. Now, what we see as we age is on the surface of our skins, but the aging process is actually more than skin deep. And I'm going to spend a little time shedding some light on it, and it will inform us on how to rejuvenate our faces. So when we think about the skin, it is the largest organ of the human body. It is what protects us from the outside world. But it's also the first sign of aging that we see, particularly when it comes to the face. This is a, a picture of a skin and you're looking at it from the under surface of the skin. Most of the time we are seeing the skin from the surface, but this is a picture showing you the under surface of the skin. You can divide the skin into layers of what we call the epidermis. The epidermis is constantly shedding, like a new layers of skin cells are coming to the surface every, every about six weeks. The deeper layer to the epidermis is called the dermis. The dermis is the area where most of the aging process tends to happen. The dermis is where you have the elastic fibers that when you, it, when you pull your skin, it can snap back. When you lose this elastic, you pull your skin, it indents, it doesn't snap back. The dermis is where you have your collagen. You, you have a defined amount of collagen, you lose it, you don't get it back. In the dermis, we have hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid sits between the cells, it plumps the skin up. But deep to the dermis is the layer called subcutaneous fat. Most of the time when we think about fat, you think it's a bad thing, but I'll tell you in the face, Fat represents youth. Fat pushes on the dermis. It pushes on the epidermis. It gives the contour and definitions that you see in a youthful face. So th these are the layers of the skin, and this is where aging tends to happen. Now, deep to the skin, we have compartments of blobs of fat that cushions the face, gives the face its fullness and contour, Around the eyelids, you have three uh, uh, compartments of fat in the upper eyelid, in the lower eyelid, in the temple area, you have a blob of fat. In the cheek, we have the middle fat pads. Along the jaw lines, we have another fat pad in the lip and in the chin. All these fat pads are held together by the skin, the three layers of skin that we, the, we already talked about. And they keep these, these fats in the appro appropriate compartments. In addition, there are muscles that hold these fats in the right position. But what happens with aging? From ages 30s to 40s to 50s, we start losing hyaluronic acid, we start losing collagen, we start losing elastin. So the pliability, the recoil, the tightness of the skin starts changing and you start seeing fine wrinkles on the surface of the skin, the loss of elastin, the loss of collagen, the loss of hyaluronic acid almost plummets quickly once we start getting to the late 30s and 40s. But as depicted here, it looks like a straight line, but it's not always a straight line. Some people, patients will come to me and said, I was fine last year, but all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. Everything just went down south. That's the loss and, uh, if, uh, of the lacin and collagen that has accumulated over years. But what is responsible for the loss of these collagen and elastin fibers? So I, I, I want to ask a question. Which area do we think ages the quickest?
when you look at your face, which area do you think is going to age the quickest or the earliest? Okay, we'll find out what the the answer to the answers you you came up with. But as you can find, as you can see, we lose the elastin, the collagen, and the hyaluronic acid because of various for various reasons. One, sun damage. Two, just inflammation of the skin. Three, smoking and exposure to pollutants, lack of sleep, our dietary habits, and lastly, our genetics. The genetics aspect we cannot change, but the remaining fe features that we talked about, we do have some control over. Now we have the results of the uh, question that we just had, 40% are saying they feel their eyes ages the earliest. And then the next one is the neckline. And then third says lips. And then the fourth is smile lines. So at the end, I'm going to tell you about what I think about the aging process, which areas ages the, the earliest. Let's try another question based on the slide that I just put up. What factors do we think are most influential on the aging process? Which features or factors do you think affects our aging process the most? Is it lifestyle factors, including sun exposure? Is it our genetics? Is it the type of diet we, 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 we have? Is it exercise? Is it amount of sleep that we have? Okay. So we have the answer to that. Lifestyle, sun exposure, and that is correct. Genetics plays a very, uh, uh, prominent role, but genetics is the constant. We can't change that. Dietary habits plays a big role. Diets that are high in antioxidants help. And sleep, sleep makes a huge difference. Now, when the skin loses its elastin and the collagen and the hyaluronic acid, the result is that you have skin laxity. When the skin becomes lax, all those fat compartments that we talked about starts shifting because there's nothing to keep it in this place. Then everything goes south as depicted in this image. In the upper, lower eyelid, you see the three fat bulges starts pushing down. And when that happens, you have a bulge in your lower eyelid it will cast a shadow and people start complaining that they have dark lines or dark circles around their eyes. They look tired, they look unrested, and they usually want something done. This, this is usually the first area of, of aging that tends to occur. Why? Because the eyelid skin is the thinnest in the face. So all these features and factors that we talked about that affect the elastin and the collagen in your skin tends to be manifested in the eyelid skin the earliest. And as a result, the fat starts pushing out. Then it manifests as a bulge under the eyelid, extra eyelid skin on the upper eyelid, dark circles under the eye. In the same way, the fat that is in the cheek, the cheek fats starts pushing down. When they drop, the contour of the cheek becomes hollow. And that is how we start developing deep frown or deep smile lines along, uh, around, above the lips. And then people start seeking ways to try to correct that. 
when the skin gets lax around the jaw, the fat around above the jawline starts pushing down. Then you start getting what we call the jowls. And then the same thing happens to the neck. So that's how the aging process happens. So we can actually predict based on your skin type, extent of sun damage, laxity in your skin, how you're going to age. And this is how this tends to manifest. Volume loss, skin texture changes, large pores. Because of sun damage, you start getting pigmentary changes. Contour defects, because now you have a highlighted cheek that is now hollow. Deep smile lines. It makes it difficult for you to even put on makeup because you can't create the definition that is that results from a highlight and, um, and shadow contrast. And as all the fat shifts inferiorly, the lower side of your face becomes wider, as wide as the upper portion. So you change from the egg-shaped face to a squarish looking face. So the distinct jawline starts, becomes, becomes broken up. The fat starts gathering here, you get a jowl, the cheek fats descend and you get deep lines as shown here. And then in addition, the corners of the mouth starts turning downwards. And it sometimes makes you look sad when you're not sad. Over the decades, you can actually see what happens. This is someone in their 20s. The cheek fats are high, no uh, smile lines. The jaw, jaw lines are defined. In the 30s, late 30s, you start beginning to see volume loss in the cheek. And as a result, the fat starts moving down and you start beginning to see the smile lines. The jaw lines are still okay. In the 40s, the smile lines gets deeper. You start seeing early jowling. In the 15s, a more pronounced jowling. And in the 60s, deep smile lines, marionette lines, broken up jaw lines, laxity in the neck. So this this progression is actually predictable. It may differ from one person to the other based on skin type, the ability to tan when they're exposed to the sun, lifestyle, but in general, this is the, this is the progression. Now, knowing this background, how can we slow this progression? How can we correct them? And what do we do to maintain our, our looks? Prevention, is always said is better than the cure. And so how do we prevent this aging process? We cannot prevent it completely, but we can, we can slow the process down. And it all comes back to maintaining as much elastin in your skin, maintaining as much collagen in your skin, maintaining as much skin volume, a uh, uh, facial volume. So from the question, most of the respondents got this question right. What are the factors do we think, inf uh, what factor influences the aging process the most? It is its lifestyle and in particular, sun exposure. Sun exposure and sun damage is the number one factor that influences the rate at which we age, facial aging. In spite of that fact, although 76% of Americans know that sun protection is important, only 41% regularly use protection, sun protection. And this is across the board. It doesn't matter whether you, are, uh, you have dark pigment or light, light pigment, regardless of skin type, sun protection is the number one way that you can slow down the aging process. Now, there are other things that measures that you can do. You can also keep your collagen and elastin as long as possible. And that comes in using agents that minimizes the breakdown of collagen and elastin. The key um, means of doing so is with the use of antioxidants. Antioxidants, you can think of them as agents that scavenge re free radicals. Free radicals are elements that actually destroy your collagen, they destroy your elastin. So if you have antioxidants, the antioxidants keep the free radicals from causing those damage. 
We do get antioxidants from the type of food that we eat, but we can also use in our skincare creams, antioxidants. One of the most potent uh, antioxidants in use on the market now is vitamin C, vitamin C. Now, if I could, if I could um, talk to you directly, most of you probably have at one point in time spent a lot of money on skincare products and you feel they don't work. And that may be true. The key to using skincare products to keep your collagen, to keep your elastin, is to find skincare products that have effective ingredients such as antioxidants. And when you find them, make sure that they are maximally absorbed so they can get into the dermis of the skin to, to effect the change that we want. In that sense, the type of skincare product, how you apply it, the sequence in which you apply it is very important. So for example, if you have an expensive skincare product with a lot of vitamin C in it, and then you put an oily, oil, oily moisturizer on your skin, then apply your vitamin C, your vitamin C is not going to be absorbed. So you look at products that have active ingredients that are effective, and you should see if the products can be maximally um, uh, absorbed. And that's when you, you get the uh, best out of your skincare products. So these are some of the things you can do to prevent the aging process from um, um, going on at a rapid pace. Beyond prevention, what can you do to correct? The end result of laxity in the skin is shifting of fat compartments in the face, manifesting as bulging in the eyelids, drooping of the fat in the cheeks to cause deep smile lines, jowling along the neckline. So as you can tell, facial volume is important so you can restore that volume. As we age, we actually tend to lose fat in our face. So in addition to the volume that we lose, the fat that we lose, plus the laxity in the skin, everything just moves down south. So how can you correct those things? You can restore volume back into the face by using filler injections. The good thing about filler injections are that they are simple to do. You go to the office, they pick the filler, you numb the skin, and then you inject it. There are a lot of fill, uh, 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 injectable fillers on the market. They work um, to different extents. Some of them last six months, others last up to two years. They are picked based on where you are trying to get them injected and how long you want the effect. The, the downside to injectable fillers are that their effects are not long lasting. There is an advantage of using a semi-permanent uh, filler, something that is not um, um, long lasting. Why? Because if you use something that is permanent today and five years down the line, we have something that is more potent or better, you are stuck with the old product. Number two, if you use something that you don't like the result, then you are stuck with it for the rest of your life. So using injectable fillers as a first step is actually a reasonable way to go to restore volume. Sometimes if the volume loss is so severe, we may recommend using facial implants, but this is not the mainstay of rejuvenating the face, but it's, it is an option. What I want to talk about more today is actually the use of fat grafts to restore volume back to the face. Why? Because fat is what you lost in the face. So if you can replace the fat, um, that will be the most ideal filler. We do fat grafting in uh, one of, of two ways. Uh, for, in most patients, we can find the fat. We usually get it from the areas that you find it most difficult to lose fat. For males, it tends to be the abdominal wall. For females, it tends to be the thighs. We can get as much as we want. And then we process the fat. We process the fat to get two types of fat for grafting. One that we call the micro fat grafting. And the second that we call the nano fat grafting. So, Micro fat grafting is done by taking a small cannula that measures about two millimeters in width 
And then through a tiny opening in the skin, in the thigh or in the belly, we use suction pressure and we can suck out the fat. When it comes out, it looks like what you're seeing in this slide, very yellowish. The fat is rinsed, um, it's filtered, and then we transfer it into a syringe. Then we can use it to put volume back to where volume has been lost in the face. And it then puts the skin back on stretch. It makes it more radiant. It gives you back facial contour. Micro fat is called micro fat because the fat cells are, are a little bit big. But if you process micro fat further, you can make them even much smaller. You actually kill most of the fat cells, but you preserve stem cells, adipose stem cells. Stem cells have the potential to really repair damaged skin. And that is what we want to gain with nanofat. So we get microfat, we process this further to get nanofat. Nano because the particles are much, much smaller. So what we do with my, uh, my nanofat? Nanofat, we tend to inject back into the dermis. Remember, the dermis is where you have your collagen, your elastin, your hyaluronic acid that you have lost because of sun damage, because of the other factors that we talked about. And we want to repair that layer. So we inject this nanofat back there and we can help improve fine wrinkles in the, on the surface of the skin, make the skin texture, improve the skin texture and its tightness. We use that. Um, to even correct scars and acne, acne scars and even surgical scars. We like nanofat in areas that we are not seeking to improve, increase volume. For example, someone has dark circles around the eye and you're just trying to correct that area. You are not, you are not interested in putting volume. You just want correction. That's where we will do nanofat. Nanofat will also be used for, to correct fine lines around the lips. On, on, on the other hand, when we use microfat, we inject into the, those fat compartments that we depicted earlier on that has lost volume and are about to shift south to cause all the jowling and the neckline laxity. So we use microfat to plump up those uh, compartments again to put the skin on stretch. So we inject nanofat in the temples. If the temples are hollow, we inject nan microfat in the cheeks to plump up the cheeks again. We will inject uh, microfat some, sometimes on the forehead, in the chin, in the lips to plump, give volume back to the face where volume has been lost. And in so doing, we, if we contour the face, we stretch wrinkles. Uh, and we can actually do it in combination with, with uh, other surgical procedures. So this is an example of a patient who presented with a very hollow face. She can put makeup to really highlight her face. You can see that shadow lines under the eye and a deflated cheek. And this is um, how the cheek looks after you've done some micro fat grafting. This is another patient who has lost some uh, volume in the cheeks. You can see some hollow line in here. The fat that used to be here, this fat used to be up here and is sagging down. And as a result, you get deep um, smile lines. And if you plump it up, you can soften the look on the face. Nanofats, very good for fine wrinkles around the, uh, the lips. Volume replacement around the lips when you lose uh, volume. Correction of dark circles around the mouth. We usually transfer them into these tiny little strangers, one millimeter each, and we inject them in with a tiny little uh, cannula, cannula. These procedures can be done in the office under local anesthesia, and patients do not need to go to sleep for them. I am a big fan of nanofat injection and fat injection because we can get as much as we need, and the correction is actually uh, amazing. So that's how we treat the skin. Now, we, we earlier on asked, which part of the face do you think ages the, uh, uh, the uh, earliest? And most people um, answered that it was the eyelid and that is correct. So let's look at what we can do for the eyelid complex. We tend to look at the eyelid together with the brow. So on your forehead in a youthful face, the forehead has reflex light. You don't see wrinkles. 
the eyelids and the eyebrows are arched high. They, ex they frame the eye. The sh eyelids are very short on the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid. And you don't see any breaks when you go from the lower eyelid to the cheek. So that's how a youthful forehead, brow, and eyelid looks like. But then over time, just because of facial expression, you can have what we call dynamic wrinkles. Your forehead is smooth, but when you raise your brow, you see all these lines kind of develop. Over time, these dynamic wrinkles will become etched into the skin and of course, what we call static wrinkles. Early dynamic wrinkles, we tend to treat them with agents that would relax the muscles, example being Botox or Dysport and other um, um, brand names. The goal with the dynamic wrinkle treatment is not to freeze the forehead. You don't want to freeze the forehead such that you don't have the ability to, ex to express emotions. We, you just want to soften the lines. When do you, should one consider doing this? Some people want to prevent the lines from being etched into their forehead. So when you start seeing them beginning to become more static, that may be the time to start considering these agents. Once those lines are etched into the skin, the, the Botox and the disc spots do help soften them, but they don't wipe them off. And in those cases, we can inject nano fat into the lines or we can inject a filler in uh, a filler injectable filler into the lines to to smooth them out but fillers and botox will not treat a droopy brow they can improve them slightly but they don't really correct a droopy brow and the brows tend to droop more towards the temple region and if that happens Yes, you may be able to use this Botox and this spot to lift them up, but the real correction is usually a surgical correction. And we call, them a, we call that procedure a brow lift. Okay, now, when you do a brow lift, you, don't, you are not trying to give somebody a surprise look. The brows are so high up, they stare at you from the distance. You look very surprised once you're talking to people, there's no expression in the face. Most people, just need the temporal part of the brow elevated, just the temporal part of the brow, the portion depicted with this light um, white uh, arrows. We can do that with what we call a temporal brow lift. This can be done as an office procedure and the local. Behind the hairline, a small incision is made, and then the skin is elevated to the brow, and then the brow is pulled, um, pulled up. If that, if that is done properly, it also actually relieves the folded eyelid skin. When your brow is down, it may seem that you have excess eyelid, but usually that is not the case. The brow needs to be pushed back up. We do what we call an endoscopic brow lift when the medial portion of the brow is sinking down. And sometimes you have to do a combination of the two, and endoscopic for the medial and a te temporal brow for the lateral. The most common reason that we see people seek uh, um, treatment for aging face is upper eyelid or lower eyelid changes. And as the questions um, um, showed, the eyelid is the area that ages the quickest because the skin is very thin and the sun damage causes laxity of the skin, the fat starts pushing out. So, when you go in for an upper eyelid uh, surgery, what you want is a more open eyelid, as we see in this picture. The eyelid crease is hidden. The incision is placed in the crease in the upper eyelid, but you don't want to take all the skin off. You still need some pleat of skin so you'll be able to close your eye. The upper eyelid blepharoplasty is, is a procedure is one of the simplest procedures that we do as facial plastic surgeons because it can be done under local anesthesia. Um, most people are back to their baseline within seven to 10 days. The main issue with this is that you should expect some bruising. There are some ways that you can minimize the bruising. The second area that is commonly addressed is the lower eyelid. And the lower eyelid can actually affect all age groups. It can start as early as the late 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And with this, as the eyelid skin becomes lax, 
the fat starts pushing out. Then you start seeing what we call the dark circles, and, and then it can progress to become big bulges. The treatment for these vary. If it's caught early, you can choose an, a non-surgical option. If the bulge is not so severe, you can do an injection into the crease to efface that line. You can do the injection with an injectable filler, or you can do the injection with a nano fat grafting as we previously discussed. If the ball, when the bulge is uh, uh, more pronounced, injection into the crease is not very effective. Then all you are doing is putting um, a, a mountain next to another mountain. And in that case, the best way is to address the bulging fat. And sometimes you address the bulging fat with a little bit of um, tightening of the lower eyelid skin. Now I'm showing pictures of females, but this is not limited to females. You can see this in males as well. This is a male patient with bulging fat in their 60s. This is a, another younger, a relatively younger patient in um, in the 30s with the same problem. The treatment uh, is similar in in males and females. So this is an example of a lower eyelid blepharoplasty. Here you see there's a dark line and a slight bulge. This was done with surgical repair of re removing just a little bit of fat. When you do it early, you don't have to touch the skin. This is done from inside the eyelid. There are no incisions on the outside. This is another patient with a more severe bulging of the fat. Surgery done from the inside the eyelid with no incisions on the outside. And you trim the fat down and, and correct the bulge as well as the depression. So you can smooth the lower eyelid down. Sometimes you have to you combine the upper eyelid blepharoplasty with the lower eyelid. And you can take care of the excess skin as well as the bulge at the same time. What you want to avoid in um, eyelid surgery is this appearance of too much taken from the upper eyelid skin that you get this hollowing look or what we call the dull look on the upper eyelid. Too much was taken out. The upper eyelid in, in, a, in a youthful eyelid is very short. You see the eyelashes and then there's a crease here and a fold of skin. In this case, too much volume has been lost. So you see hollowing of the upper eyelid. When patients present with this appearance, we actually put some fat back to recreate a more useful eyelid. So you want to avoid this particular look when you seek out uh, blepharoplasty. The same is true for the lower eyelid. You don't want too much done to the lower eyelid such the lower eyelid becomes rounded. And then in that case, you see too much of the, um, the, the white portion of the, of, of the eye. So that's what you want to avoid when seeking um, eyelid rejuvenation. And then la lastly, we said the features that are uh, characteristic, for, characteristic of a youthful rejuvenated face is a clear, distinct jawline. With a jawline, there are no injections or fillers that are effective in correcting a jawline when it has progressed to a point that you have jowling and laxity in the skin. In that case, a neck lift or a facelift is the most effective way of addressing it. Now we use the term facelift, neck lift interchangeably. Usually really a facelift is, facelift is addressing the neckline. If you try to use a facelift to do more than that, that's when the face starts looking overdone, over pulled, and it then looks unnatural. So this is a, a someone in their 40s. They're beginning to get early signs of neck aging, platysma banding falls under the skin, early jowling, loss of volume in the cheek, the corners of the mouth wants to turn down. So in this age group, when you do what we call a natural neck lift, the corners of the mouth are straightened out again, the jawline becomes well-defined, the mouth is not over pulled. You do not want that over pulled look. It tells everybody that you did something and that something is not natural appearing at all. A natural looking uh, neck lift has hidden sc uh, scars. We place the scars 
in front of the ear, behind what we call the triggers, and we hide the rest of this incision behind the ear, even if we have to go there. The, you One should be able to wear their hair up in the ponytail without the scars becoming visible. And for sure, you want to avoid the overpulled appearance, as is with this uh, patient. And in, in the front view, the jaw lines have been nicely restored. The neck laxity is corrected. Corners of the mouth are now horizontal. Horizontal, the, the jowling is corrected. And again, the overpulled look is avoided. This is another person who had a neck cleft or a neck cleft in their 50s. When we do the neck lifts to address the neck, at the same time, we can do fat injection into the cheek area to address the mid face and the small lines. We never like to use a face lift or a neck lift to try to correct the smile lines. If you do that, then you, the corners of the mouth become too pulled. This is another patient. The jowling is corrected. The corners of the mouth are beginning to straighten. The small lines are softened. This looks more natural and the neck lines are cleaned up. This is another patient. And, and in someone who had the same procedure done in the 50s, you don't want to overdo it. You just want to soften that appearance. And someone in the late 60s who underwent the same procedure, soften the neck lines, correct the jowls, soften the marionette lines, no overpulled look. So in summary, you, there are things you can do to pre prevent or slow down the aging process, avoiding sun, uh, uh, sun damage, using sunscreen, picking your diet carefully, using topical um, skin creams, creams that are effective, resting enough, correction, when you're looking for corrective procedures, volume restoration is key, skin rejuvenation is, key, uh, is a key, natural looking surgical lifts as needed, avoiding the overdone um, uh, appearance. Once you've corrected these things, you want to maintain. Maintenance also comes back again to all the features you did to prevent aging in the first place, effective skin products, sunscreen, and sometimes touch-ups as needed. I would end here and, and take questions. Dr. Bohini, you have two questions in the chat. Okay, let's look. Okay, so the first question I say, what are your thoughts on collagen supplements, capsules and powders? There are so many options, cause how do we know what is best? That's a very good question. You remember I put on a slide that said, if you're going to use a product, you want to get the product that has the active ingredient that gets into the right layer. Those active ingredients should get to the layer of the dermis. With collagen supplements and powders, if you are taking them by mouth, I'm not sure I know of any data that says how effective they are in improving the skin. There, there are collagen products that can be injected into the skin. Those have fallen out of favor because they don't last very long and they have been replaced by hyaluronic acids. So you are right with so many products out there. We never know which ones are effective. The most effective way of rejuvenating the skin, again, is avoiding the damage to start off with and using products that are high in antioxidants. The second question is, what are some of the ingredients or products you recommend? Do you recommend Retin-A products with hyaluronic acid? So th this second question is similar to the first. Retin-A Retin is one of the most effective skincare products that we have. What does Retin-A do? Remember, we talked about the skin as having multiple layers, with the top layer being the epidermis. Retin-A increases the cycling of the epidermis so that dead skin cells uh, on the surface are shed quickly, so younger ones come to the, to the surface. So if you have pigmentary changes in the skin, 
Retin-A is very good for that. Um, if you have dull skin, Retin-A helps shed the top, uh, surface layers of the skin out. If you are using Retin-A in combination with other products, it may allow the other products to penetrate into the uh, dermal layer much better. So yes, I do re recommend Retin-A. Retin-A is supposed to be used at night so that it's not exposed to the sun. It comes in different strengths. It peels the skin, so you should use it under, with some um, direction. Some people have to start very low in strength and inch the, uh, the strength up. Sometimes I tell my patients, instead of starting every day, start every day, every other day and get the skin used to it before you start going every day. There's another question. How long does a face lift last? That's a very good question. I always tell patients, face lifts last forever. Um, and that's a tongue in cheek answer. They last forever in the sense that you will always be behind in the aging process where you otherwise would have been without the facelift. But to specifically answer your question, depending on how the facelift is done, most people may need a touch up five to 10 years down the line. And those touch ups usually are more minor skin um, skin tightening procedures. Of course, when you've had a facelift, you have to do certain things to maintain that left. And those are the sun avoidance, sunscreen, some topical agents that would preserve the skin as uh, tight as possible for the lo as long as possible. <laughs> There's another question about, are you able to provide cosmetic services during the quarantine? Good, good question. There was a New York Times article that shows that the number, the number of cosmetic procedures being done has actually gone up during this quarantine. Now, there, there, are, there are various reasons for that. M most people just wanted, have always wanted something done, but never had the time to do so. Now that they are working from home, they have more time to do the surgeries and recover from them. So a lot of people are taking advantage and having these things done. Secondly, people who were concerned about the recovery process, having their faces exposed during the recovery, now they have a mask on, so they can cover their faces during the recovery. That is prompting people to have this, these cosmetic surgeries done. Now, understanding this above, uh, above reasons, early on in the pandemic, when we didn't really understand the COVID, um, the, the virus, we, most states and most practices put a hold on elective surgeries, including cosmetic surgeries. Now that we have a good sense of our resources and how the virus works, cosmetic surgeries are being offered again. There is a question from a fellas. My Asian skin is prone to keloids. For the eye surgery, should keloids become an issue? Is there anything that can help with this? That's a very good question. In my practice, I take care of a lot of scars and, and keloids. And I, I have a very multi-ethnic uh, practice. I see Caucasians, Asians, uh, uh, people of African descent. It is rare, almost never, to see keloids in the central portion of the face. I would never, I won't say it's impossible, but in my busy practice, I have never seen a keloid on the eyelid, on the nose, on the central upper lip. It's not common. So I, I, you, you, it's very unusual to have a keloid on, a, an, on the upper eyelid um, incision that is used for blepharoplasty. There's an, another question how best to address the lines between between the brows. So the, 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 the lines between the brows, we describe them as the number 11 because sometimes you have two of them. They result because of contraction of a muscle called the corrugator muscles. The corrugator muscles is what you use to frown. If you get those lines between your eyes and they are dynamic, meaning they only show up when you frown, then the treatment for it is to soften those corrugator muscles. And then you, you, you tend to select Botox or Dispot or something equivalent to soften it. But if those lines have been etched in to the skin already, 
meaning they are there visible, whether you frown or not, they are called static lines. Static lines can be in, improved with the Botox, but in those cases, we add a filler injection under the line. And a filler injection are, can be any of those injectable fillers like we, we, we described, and it could also be the nano fat injection that I, I talked about. Um, there's a question from Debra. Will face lift address the lines around the mouth? The answer is, the simple answer is no. So there are two lines, two sets of lines around the mouth, mouth that I want to talk about. One is the vertical lines that go up and down from around the upper lip, more pronounced in people who have had, a, uh, who smoke a lot, okay? If you try to use the facelift to address those lines, it means you have to pull the face so tight that your face starts looking very, very awkward. I'm sure many of you have seen examples of that. And that is a deterrent to getting the face facelift. So facelift should not be used to try to address lines around the mouth. But there are some additional procedures that can be done during a facelift to improve those lines, such as a chemical peel around the mouth, such as nano fat injection into those lines, such as injectable fillers into the line, such as laser resurfacing on of those lines. The second set of lines are the smile, smile lines. Those are the ones that go from the nose to the corner of the mouth. Those small lines happen because most of the fat in the cheek becomes deflated and it settles down. So during facelift, if that is a pronounced, if the small lines are pronounced, we tend to inflate, inject fat into the cheek to lift that up or during the surgery, we do what we call a mid face lift to correct those. You have to be careful. It has to be carefully, uh, uh, properly done so as not to pull the corner of the mouth to make it look funny. Uh, there's another question. I have lost my neck. I feel like based on your presentation that a natural facelift will be the best option for me. I am 62 years and I have a fuller face that has helped me not show wrinkles. That's good for a long time, but now they are shifting. What will be my next best step? Okay, so I'm going to address this question as a neck lift. So when we are trying to define the neck lift and neckline, there are two, may, three main things we consider. One is the jawline. Some people have weak jaws. Their jaw, the chin is retrusive and the skin kind of drapes on that retrusive chin, um, jawline. Jaw, jaw in some people, we actually will stretch the jawline forward either with an implant or actually moving the bone so we can have a very defined neckline. That's number one. Number two, if we feel like you have fullness in the under the neck, what we call the submental fat, we actually suck out some of those fat. That is the one area that we tend to remove fat, whereas in the fa face, we tend to put fat back. So under the neck, you can suck out some of the fat and then, and then redrape the skin. Thirdly, there are some people who have what we call an anterior position hyoid bone. Hyoid bone is what sits above the Adam's apple. If your hyoid bone is far forward, it blunts your neckline. If your hyoid bone is far back, then you can have a very distinct neckline. So the, those are the three elements that we consider when we are trying to rejuvenate or um, um, the neckline. There are no injections or exercise. I've seen some appliances being pedaled online to try to tighten the neckline, those are not effective. So if you want to improve the neckline, mostly it's usually redraping skin, moving fat back up, tightening things to get a defined neckline. Another question, does more expensive product mean better product? Are there some lower cost product brands you recommend? And um, I can't really specifically recommend brands, but I can recommend active ingredients. So when you, the more expensive doesn't necessarily mean better. Sometimes the expenses you are paying for the packaging, you are paying for the name brand. You should look when you're looking for products, the active ingredient, antioxidants, right? 
a lot of them may have some lactic acid, uh, glycolic acid, formulations that would actually make a change at the level of the dermis and also find out how they are formulated to get the active product into the right, right layer. The, the, the sequence in which you use your skincare products are also very important. Sometimes if you have a lot of dead skin on your, or, uh, on your, on your skin, it's better to get rid of the dead skin before you start applying all these uh, skincare products. So look for the active ingredients, not necessarily the brand. So what are your top, what about topical hyaluronic acid, 1.5 over the counter with moisturizers? All of those are better than nothing, right? The moisturizers are keeping the uh, uh, moisture in the skin. The hyaluronic acid is supposed to penetrate to get into the de dermis. You, usually when you see these products, you want to see what is the technology behind that product that is going to get that hyaluronic acid to go through the epidermis to get to the dermis, which is where you want them to be effective. Is, uh, re is retinol eye cream effective? Again, the simple answer is yes. Of most, amongst all the skincare products out there, retinol based products are usually effective. They come at different, they come in different strengths. Uh, of course, the stronger the product, the more effective they are, but you have to know your skin. You have to know your skin and, and pick the right product. If you use any skincare product that irritates the skin, it is not the right product for you. And usually under the guidance of a facial plastic surgeon or a dermatologist, they can look at your skin and say, this may be better than the other. What one product that might work for a friend may not necessarily be the right product for you. Uh, Anne Kearns uh, asked the question about how long is recovery? Uh, I'm not sure recovery um, based on which specific pr procedure. So let me just in general, for injectable fillers, uh, the re recovery is a matter of days. Um, if you are thinking about eyelid blepharoplasty, the recovery you have to give yourself about seven to 10 days. Um, for neck lifts, um, you should really give yourself a recovery of about two weeks. Most of the time we do this surgery, some of them actually can be done under local anesthesia. You don't have to go to sleep for them based on your, your anatomy and what you can tolerate. A lot of them, we do them under what we call conscious sedation, um, meaning they give you an IV sedation and you're breathing on your own throughout the surgery. You're not aware of what you're doing. Um, um, the recovery really for those types of more involved surgery is seven to seven to seven days to two weeks. Um, most people are presentable by the end of the second week. Roughly how much is a neck lift? That, that is a question I can't answer off, off the top of my head. Neck, neck lifts are built based on the surgeon's fees, the anesthesiologist fees, and the facility fees. So there are usually three components that goes together. Uh, but if you, if you reach out to our office, they will be able to um, give you uh, um, an idea. How do you address a double chin? So double chins are cause, the, there are different reasons. Double chin will, commonly will be because there's uh, uh, fat under the chin. Um, and if that is the only reason we liposuction the fat, there are some um, treatment options to inject some medications into the fat to melt them. Those are not my, um, my favorite procedures because they are not predictable. Um, we can liposuction the fat. If you do that type of surgery very early when you still have enough collagen and elastin in your skin, that's all you need to do. You suck out the fat and the skin and the neckline kind of pushes up. If you do it later in the late, maybe 40s, 50s, you may have too much laxity of skin that if you suck out the fat, the skin will actually become loose. So then you have to tighten them. Some people get the appearance of a, a double chin just because they have laxity of muscles and, and skin in their neck. And in that case, you, you, you have to tighten them. But in general, most commonly double chin, chin tends to happen because of fat accumulation under the neck and liposuction is a treatment for it. I have heard of people 
getting droopy eyelids with Botox. How do you prevent this? Is it avoidable? Can it be corrected when it happens? Okay. So the, the, the muscles around the eyelids that we target with Botox are mus muscles that are causing wrinkle, wrinkles. And those tend to, tend to be on the outer portion of the eyelid. The muscles that, muscle that is responsible for opening the eyelid and keeping your eyelid up sits on the central portion of the upper eyelid. If you inject Botox in that area, you would definitely get a droopy eyelid. So just having someone who is comfortable with the anatomy of the face do your Botox is one of the ways to avoid droopy eyelids. The eyelid injections are centered on the outside between the media portions of the brow, avoiding the central portion of the upper eyelid. When these happen, usually it's um, they were not the target of the injection, so they tend to recover after about two weeks. Unfortunately, if it happens, you have to let the Botox wear off. There are some medications that we can use to try to get the eyelid to lift up slightly, but in general, the Botox has to wear off, and that tends to happen after about two weeks. I have one eye larger than the other after eyelid surgery. Can that be corrected? Um, yes, we usually have to think about what makes the eyelid, uh, one eye look larger than the other. Usually, if you've had an upper and lower blepharoplasty, it tends to be the lower one that causes the problem. One lower eyelid is pulled down with more white showing than the other. And if that is the case, the correction is to fix the retraction. If the problem is the upper eyelid, that can be corrected as well. So there are options to try to even even that uh, um, the eyelids up if you've had some complications from previous surgeries. How long will fat injections last? Okay, in principle, fat injections are supposed to last forever. But in practice, usually you may need to top them off after about three or four years. Why? When you put the fat cells in, you are actually implanting a living cell. The only issue is that if I put 10 fat cells in a place, not all the 10 will survive. About 60% to 70% of them will survive. Once they survive, they are there to stay. They may fluctuate, but they are there to stay. So that's why the fat injection, it's a procedure I really like because it gives a longer term, um, longer lasting effect. But with aging process, you will still lose some volume and maybe four years, five years down the line, you may need to touch it up. And if you're touching it up, you may not necessarily need to do fat injection again. You may touch it up with just an injectable filler. Can you recommend a certain line to use for skincare? Unfortunately, I would like to avoid sticking with a specific brand name uh, rather, again, I will direct you to the active um, products that I think are effective on skin, ret 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 Retin-A being one, antioxidants being the other. Antioxidants, they are various forms, they come in various forms, vitamin C being a very potent antioxidant. One say, oh, next question, thank you for being so thorough and providing clear descriptions. Um, the goal of this seminar is to give you some foundation to understand when someone recommends something, you should know why they are recommending it and what is it going to really treat. Do you have any recommendations as to how to research a good surgeon who works with nanofat since I'm in Orange County, California? Thank you so much. Um, if you, I, I think the webs, the 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 webs websites are very good place to start with. If you if you Google fat grafting, um, you would you would kind of come up with it's a common procedure that we do, um, and then once you get um, 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 some example a page um, practices that are. Uh, doing it regularly, then you can ask them furthermore about the nano fat grafting. There is a difference between just gross fat grafting and nano fat grafting. Uh, but in general, start off with what they have on their website, um, call the office, um, 
ask them the difference between their procedure, how they do it, what are their outcomes, and that should usually direct you to someone who has good experience in that procedure. Do you specialize in just the face? The answer is yes, I'm a facial plastic surgeon. I focus on the face. I, I, I may go to the leg and get something, but it always ends up on the face. So you specialize in face, facial, uh, the face, yes. I specialize only on the face. I do microsurgery, which will mean I can transplant tissue from one part of the body to the other. So you will find me doing, taking bone from the leg or muscle from the thigh, um, fat from the thigh or the belly or the chest, but usually they always end up in the face or the head and neck region. I think that's about all, all time we have for questions today. Perfect. Well, thank you all for um, attending. Um, there is a slide at the end of our my presentation. Um, you know uh, how to reach us, and if you have further questions, we'll be happy to answer them for you.